So now that we've explored the functions of the stomach and we're left with chyme from the stomach in the small intestine, it's time to look at the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas before we can really consider digestion any further. Secretions from the liver and pancreas are going to enter the digestive tract near the junction of the small intestine and the stomach. These secretions are so important to the digestive processes of the small intestine that it's going to be necessary to understand them before continuing on to the intestinal physiology. The liver will consider first is a reddish brown gland. It's the largest gland in our body. It's located in the upper right quadrant, just beneath the diaphragm. It weighs about 1.4 kilograms or three pounds, and it does have a variety of functions as we've already examined. However, the secretion of bile is important because it contributes to digestion. So the other functions we'll consider in the following chapter. Let's first consider the gross anatomy of the liver. It's composed of four lobes. Let's start with the right and left lobes. The right lobe is here and the left lobe is here. We can see these clearly from the anterior perspective. These lobes are separated by the falciform ligament, which is a sheet of mesentery that suspends the liver from the diaphragm. At the bottom of the falciform ligament, we'll see the round ligament. The round ligament is a fibrous remnant of what was the umbilical vein that used to carry blood from the umbilical cord to the liver of the fetus. We can only see the other two lobes, the quadrate and caudate lobe, when we flip the liver over and look at it from an inferior view. So from the inferior, we can see the quadrate lobe the quadrate lobe is right here between the gallbladder and the falciform ligament. And then we can see the caudate lobe up here. And the caudate lobe is right between the inferior vena cava and the falciform ligament. The porta hepatis is an irregular opening between these lobes. The porta hepatis is composed of the hepatic portal vein, the proper hepatic artery, and then also the exit for bile passages. All of these are going to travel through the lesser omentum. The gallbladder adheres to a depression in the inferior surface of the liver between the quadrate and the right lobe of the liver. The bare area is uh, considered bare just because it has no serosa of its own because this is where it attaches to the diaphragm. Now let's step deeper inside the liver to examine hepatic lobules. Here I'll outline one lobule in red here. This is one hepatic lobule. In reality, they're just about two millimeters long and about one millimeter in diameter. They have a central vein with radiating sheets of hepatocytes. Now, this will be much like if you took your textbook and folded the hard covers back to meet each other. The pages would be like the radiating rays of hepatocyte sheets. Hepatocytes are cuboidal cells that surround this central vein. Each plate of hepatocytes is about two cells thick. Between the sheets of hepatocytes, you'll see these hepatic sinusoids. And we've looked at these before when we were looking at capillary perfusion. Hepatic sinusoids are these blood-filled channels, filling spaces between the plates. Here's an image of the sinusoid. We've seen this one before. They are lined by fenestrated endothelium, which is going to separate the hepatocytes here from the red blood cells in here. It allows plasma into the space between the hepatocytes and the endothelium. The hepatocytes also have a brush border. You can see these hair-like projections here on the border. And that increases the surface area so that blood can be filtered through the sinusoids at a higher rate. This blood is coming directly from the stomach and intestines. 
So the blood supply is picked up nutrients from the digestive system and it's bringing it into the liver. There are also hepatic macrophages. As you can see, there's an example of one right here or Kupfer cells. These are phagocytic cells that remove bacteria and debris from the blood. Hepatocytes have many different functions, so let's just take a moment to look at those. After a meal, the hepatocytes are in absorbing from the blood lots of different things, all the things that came from the stomach and the small intestine. As we'll see later, these include glucose, amino acids, iron, vitamins, other nutrients that we might have got for metabolism or storage. It's also going to remove and degrade toxins, hormones, bile pigments, and drugs that we consume. It secretes into the blood albumin and lipoproteins, clotting factors, angiotensinogen, and some other products. Between meals, the hepatocytes are going to break down stored glycogen and release glucose into the blood. The hepatic lobules are connected by sparse connective tissue. Vessels make their way through the liver as a hepatic triad. There will be two blood vessels, the proper hepatic artery and a branch of the hepatic portal vein, as well as a bile ductule. The blood supply to the sinusoids is a mixture then of nutrient-laden venous blood that comes from the stomach and intestines, as well as freshly oxygenated arterial blood that arrives from the celiac trunk. After filtering through the sinusoids, the blood's going to be collected in the central vein, which ultimately will flow into the right and left hepatic veins. It's going to leave the liver at its superior surface and immediately drain right into the inferior vena cava to return to the heart. Here's a slide showing that histology. Here, again, outlined in red, is going to be a hepatic lobule. You've got the central vein here, and then a triad. We've got a branch of the hepatic portal vein here. We've got a bile ductule right here, and then a branch of the proper hepatic artery here, forming the triad. The bile travels in little canaliculi. They're narrow channels into which the liver secretes bile originally. We'll see some of these around here. The bile will then pass into these ductules, and the ductules will converge and, and will ultimately reach the right and left hepatic ducts. The right and left hepatic ducts come together to form the common hepatic duct, which is shortly joined by the cystic duct, which comes from the gallbladder and joins the common hepatic duct. The bile duct is formed by the union of the common hepatic ducts and the cystic ducts. Those will descend through the lesser omentum towards the duodenum. The bile duct is going to join the duct of the pancreas very close to the duodenum, and that forms a little bit of an expanded chamber called the hepatopancreatic ampulla. This is going to terminate in a fold of tissue called the major duodenal papilla right here. The major duodenal papilla contains muscular hepatopancreatic sphincter, or the sphincter of odi. And this sphincter regulates the passage of bile and pancreatic juice into the duodenum. Between meals, the sphincter closes and prevents the release of bile. But as soon as some food, chyme, makes it into the duodenum, the sphincter will open and release bile, and pancreatic juice into the duodenum. Now, let's see how much we've retained from the circulation and bile supply of the hepatic lobules. So pull out a pen and paper, and let's begin diagramming. Here's the list of things that you should include. Vessels of the triad. Think about what those are. There's three of them. 
the sinusoid and venous supply from the intestine as well as arterial supply from the celiac trunk and direction of blood flow in each of these, as well as looking at the bile ductules, the hepatic ducts, the common hepatic ducts, the cystic duct, and the bile duct. So put these together in a picture. Pause the lecture here and see what you come up with. Okay, now let's take a closer look at the gallbladder itself. Remember, it's a small pear-shaped sac on the underside of the liver. And it serves to store and concentrate bile that's secreted by the liver. It concentrates it by about a factor of 20. It absorbs water and electrolytes, thus leaving a more concentrated solution. It's only about 10 centimeters long, and it's lined by highly folded mucosa of simple columnar epithelium. The main body of it, the head, or the fundus, usually projects slightly below the inferior margin of the liver, so it's visible there. And the neck, or the cervix, leads directly into the cystic duct. Bile or is a yellow-green fluid that contains minerals and cholesterol, neutral flats, phospholipids, bile pigments, and bile acids. Bilirubin is one of the principal pigments in bile, and it's derived from the decomposition of hemoglobin. Remember when we looked at the components of blood. Bacteria in the large intestine actually convert bilirubin into urobilinogen, which is brown in color and responsible for the brown color of feces. Without any bile secretion, we'll see that feces would have more of a gray or even white color with streaks of digested fat. There are bile acids in bile or bile salts, which are steroids that have been synthesized from cholesterol. Bile acid, along with lecithin, which is a phospholipid, aid in fat digestion and absorption. We'll take a look at that role later. Bile gets to the gallbladder by first filling the bile duct, which then overflows into the gallbladder. The liver will secrete about 500 milliliters to 1,000 milliliters or a liter of bile each day. 80% of that is going to be reabsorbed in the ileum and further down in the small intestine and then returned to the liver. 20% of it is going to be excreted in the feces. This is the body's only way of eliminating excess cholesterol. The liver is going to synthesize new bile acids from cholesterol to replace those that have been lost in the feces. Enterohepatic circulation is the root of secretion, reabsorption, and resecretion of bile acids. And this can happen two or more times during the digestion of an average meal, just recycling the bile acids that have been generated by the liver. Gallstones result from bile becoming too concentrated. They're hard masses that get stuck in either the gallbladder or the bile ducts. They're composed primarily of cholesterol, some calcium carbonate, and some bilirubin. They're most common in obese women over 40 because of an excess cholesterol. When they obstruct the ducts, this is really painful. And that also causes jaundice or a yellowing of the skin due to bile pigment accumulation. Poor fat digestion is also a result of gallstones because the bile can't be secreted. And then impaired absorption of fat soluble vitamins. Lithotripsy is the use of ultrasonic vibration to pulverize the stones without surgery. Let's now take a look at the pancreas. The pancreas is a very spongy organ. It's retroperitoneal, so posterior to the peritoneum. 
and it's just posterior to the greater curvature of the stomach, so the lower curve of the stomach. There are three main regions of the pancreas, the head that's encircled by the duodenum, the beginning of the small intestine, and then the body, and then the tail over here. The pancreas is both an endocrine and an exocrine gland. As you remember from our chapter on endocrine function, the pancreatic islets are responsible for release of insulin and glucagon that have very important roles in blood sugar regulation. The exocrine portion, which is 99% of the pancreas, secretes about 1,200 to 1,500 milliliters of pancreatic juice a day, about a liter and a half of pancreatic juice a day. There are secretory acini inside the pancreas, and they release their secretions into small ducts that will then converge on the main pancreatic duct. The pancreatic duct runs lengthwise through the middle of the pancreas, and it joins the bile duct at the hepatopancreatic ampulla right here. The hepatopancreatic ampulla is guarded by the hepatopancreatic sphincter, which we last looked at when we looked at gallbladder secretions. The accessory pancreatic duct is a much smaller duct that branches off from the main pancreatic duct and it enters the duodenum without having to bypass the hepatopancreatic sphincter. This allows the pancreatic juice to be released into the duodenum even when bile is not being released. The pancreatic juice itself is a very alkaline mixture and it consists of water, enzymes, zymogens. What were zymogens again? Take a moment. Zymogens. So zymogens were proteins that were secreted that need to be later modified in order to assume their active form. There's also sodium bicarbonate in pancreatic juice and some other electrolytes. The acini secrete enzymes as well as zymogens. You'll see these small zymogen granules in the acinar cells. The ducts themselves secrete bicarbonate. The bicarbonate is going to then buffer the hydrochloric acid that's arriving from the stomach. So let's look at pancreatic zymogens. There's trypsinogen, chymotrypsinogen, and procarboxypeptidase. Trypsinogen is secreted, well, all three are secreted into the lumen of the duodenum by the pancreas. Trypsinogen is converted by an enzyme called enterokinase into trypsin. Trypsin will then have an autocatalytic effect on itself by converting more trypsinogen into trypsin, as well as converting chymotrypsinogen and procarboxypeptidase into chymotrypsin and carboxypeptidase, which we'll examine the functions of as we start to look at the small intestines functions. There are some other pancreatic enzymes. We're going to see pancreatic amylase, which is involved in digestion of starch. We will also see pancreatic lipase, involved in the digestion of fat and then ribonuclease and deoxoribonuclease. And those words should seem familiar. Ribonucle, deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA and RNA, need to be degraded also. Take a moment here and diagram the secretions of pancreatic enzymes and of pancreatic zymogens. So establish the role of trypsinogen in the conversion of chymotrypsin and procarboxypeptidase to their active forms, as well as pairing up the pancreatic enzymes, amylase, lipase, ribonuclease, and deoxyribonuclease with their functions.
So pause here and create that diagram. So these secretions are all regulated by three primary functions. So the release of pancreatic juice as well as bile are controlled by these three different stimuli. First of all, acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is released from the vagus nerve as well as the enteric nerves, those that wrap the small intestine. They stimulate the acini to secrete their enzymes even during the cephalic phase of gastric control, so way before food is swallowed. And then the acini hold on to those secretions until chyme enters the small intestine. Then we have cholecystokinin, CCK. It's secreted by the mucosa of the duodenum in response to arrival of fats in the small intestine. It stimulates the pancreatic acini to secrete enzymes, and it strongly stimulates the gallbladder to contract and release its contents, and that causes bile discharge and pancreatic juice discharge into the duodenum. Finally, we have secretin, which is released from the duodenum itself in response to the acidity of chyme arriving from the stomach. It stimulates the ducts of the liver and the pancreas to secrete more sodium bicarbonate. And this is really important in neutralizing the acidity released from the stomach. It raises pH to a level that pancreatic and intestinal digestive enzymes require so that the small intestine can do its job. Take a moment now to diagram the negative feedback loop that shows how secretin influences duodenal pH. As duodenal pH decreases, becomes more acidic, how does secretin function to raise the pH more towards neutral levels so that the digestive enzymes can function? So now that we've completed the section on the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas, you should have three diagrams. Finally, we're ready to move on and explore the functions of the small intestine where the majority of digestion and absorption happens.